So for my presentation, I chose to talk about the effectiveness of electrostimulation or e-stim as a treatment for Bell's palsy. Throughout this presentation, we're going to talk about the general overview of this diagnosis, what it is, how it can be diagnosed, and also some other treatments associated with it. So to start off, what is Bell's palsy? Bell's palsy is peripheral facial paralysis from, from an acute lesion, lesion being an area or region um, that has suffered some damage to the tissue. It is an idiopathic disease, meaning the cause of it is unknown. And more specifically about that lesion, it is damage to cranial nerve 7, um, which is also known as the facial nerve. You can see in the picture I added in to show you the facial nerve um, running down the side of the face, it does branch off into many different areas of the face that if damaged can compromise a lot of different functions in patients. Two I added in were the um, kind of two of the big ones were speech and eating. And this diagnosis can present in individuals being either unilateral or bilateral. How can this be diagnosed? Um, usually, Bell's palsy can be diagnosed at first sight. However, for a more precise diagnosis, um, different tests are, are required for that besides a general physical exam. Some of these I included, the, the two major ones were the electromyography, which is the use of electro electrodes either attached to your skin or inserted into the muscle itself. And then you're able to see exactly the electrical activity of that specific muscle tissue. The second one I added in was an electroneurography, which is the measurement of the speed of conduction of those impulses down that peripheral nerve. Um, this test is done to detect and figure out, you know, roughly the extent of damage done in an individual. The means of measure for this article were visual outer appearance, as you can see in this woman to the right, um, facial symmetry, and overall symmetrical facial movements. Participation type for this was five total studies with a total of 257 participants. For study one, uh, there were 102 total patients broken down into a control group of 29 and another group of 73 patients. That second group containing 73 patients uh, was further broken down into two separate groups. The first group holding 38 patients that were treated with just electric stimulation and facial exercise, or functional exercise, I'm sorry. And the second group of 35 were just treated with functional exercises. The follow-up period for this study was done over 12 months. For the second study, it included 18 total patients, a control group of 6, and an experimental group of 12. Across the board in this study, uh, patients received electrical stimulation with the parameters of 100 hertz for 20 minutes a day, and the results were evaluated by photography photos and video recordings of these individuals. For study three, it included 16 total patients in two experimental groups, eight and eight. First group received conventional treatment, which they listed was five minutes of heat, 10 minutes of massage, and 10 minutes of facial exercise. Second group of eight received the same conventional treatment as group one, but they also received 30 minutes of electrical stimulation. Treatment for these groups uh, was one time a week for four to 12 weeks until they saw 80% recovery in these patients, and, initially and they initially started treatment within 30 days of lesion appearance. Moving on to study four, study four contained 56 total patients uh, ranging in ages from 15 to 60 years old um, in two experimental groups, 28 and 28. First group of 28 received treatment with electrical stimulation plus exercise and group two was treated with only the functional exercise. 
treatment for both groups was three times a day, six days a week for three months. For study five, it included 65 total patients. Um, participants ranged in age from 15, I'm sorry, 18 to 78 years old in the two experimental groups. Group one included 28 patients treated with facial massage only, and group two was treated or group two included 37 patients treated with e-stim and functional exercise. It didn't specify uh, how often group one was being treated for, but group two, uh, the treatment was one to two times a week for an entire year. For the results page of study one, patients on both groups completely recovered within 20 days. Um, recovery time for this diagnosis can be uh, very quick as you can see in this study it was in 20 days usually patients are able to regain functional motion and achieve uh, symmetry in their face within a certain amount of time this is not a long-lasting pathology but in some individuals it can be study two results um, experimental groups showed better facial symmetry than the control groups. For study three, no difference uh, was observed between treatments uh, between the two groups. Study four results, uh, functional exercise, better improved symmetrical movements um, overall. And study five, the e-stim and functional exercise group of treated patients improved clinically better than massage treated group of patients. I also added in the chart of results of the five individual studies just so if you need to you can pause the video and take a look at those and how it breaks down into each individual study. Moving on into the overall strength of the research, um, you know, some studies compared to others went into greater detail regarding Easton parameters, like I mentioned, and how they recorded progress while others did not, um, which kind of kind of stinks. But something else that I think should have been done was that there needs to be a further follow-up period with these participants such as I mentioned, the only study to have a follow-up period was study one, um, which was that initial year. Another critique I had uh, about this article was that um, the research didn't include what functional exercise they had the patients doing. All it said was that it was performed in front of a mirror. So... You know, that only really leads me to believe it was probably facial expression exercises, which are the common exercises given to these patients. Um, I included some of them to the right here. Um, and that the mirror was used for cueing and proper feedback of these individuals. How is this pertinent to us as clinicians? You know, we're going to encounter these patients with this pathology. So I just wanted to bring it to your attention and wanted you to realize that we need to know that this diagnosis can include other personal factors other than just the visual outer appearance we see. You know, these people may be experiencing some self-esteem issues based on how they perceive themselves and look in the mirror. And it's common for people to delay coming into treatment to get this worked on solely uh, based on the fact that they're going out in public and they're going to be seen by others. So they, I guess they don't want to be perceived negatively by others. So we just have to be conscious and aware that they may be feeling this way. And I'm not saying to baby them, but you know, just, just be thinking about how they're feeling as we're treating them. A couple questions I just left at the bottom for you to think about. You know, do you see this type of treatment being beneficial? What did you take away from this article? I hope you were able to take something away. And finally, did you learn something new? These are my references. Thanks for watching.